Uh, this is uh, Brian Hill of USWG Alternative interviewing uh, Dr. Michael Kaufman at around March 8, 2012. All right, you can begin. Okay, Brian, one of the things that uh, we had talked about earlier is what Agenda 21 truly means to people here in the United States. And let me just kind of go over that just a little bit to give you a little bit of background for those of you who may not un really understand it. Agenda 21 is a United Nations document that President Bush signed back in 1992 at the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit. Uh, it is a 40 chapter document that t totally defines what human beings can and cannot do, both in as far as their interactions with each other and their interactions with the environment. It is a very, very comprehensive document. It actually uh, outlines literally everything that we can do and cannot do. Now, now, does that have the force of law? No, it doesn't. It is a voluntary program at this particular point. However, the United Nations has a treaty in the wings called, called the Covenant on the Environment and Development that does put legal teeth into everything that uh, Agenda 21 is designed to do. Now, you will hear from different people that Agenda 21 is not being implemented in America. Well, it is uh, in some cases, especially with what we call ICLE, the organization right out of the United Nations, the international, um, I can't try and think of the, the actual name, but it basically will define exactly what we can and cannot do uh, from the United Nations. How, most of the planning, however, that is involved with Agenda 21 is not called Agenda 21. It's called Sustainable America. Sustainable America was taken by President, was created by President Clinton uh, in 1995 by the, the President's Council on Sustainable Development, one half of which belonged to an international organization called the IUCN or the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. That particular organization has set up the whole Agenda 21 process. It has been involved in almost all of the activities that have come through the federal government over recent years, uh, well, the last 25 years at least. And basically what, what the IUCN has done is allowed us, or basically told us what we can do and what we cannot do in relationship to nature or envi the environment. One of the things that really bothers me is that President Clinton with his Sustainable America, which was written to meet the requirements of Agenda 21 in the United Nations, actually is the cornerstone of all U.S. grants and so forth of different agencies to local governments, to the state or to your city or to your, your county, whatever the case might be. All of it has ties back into Sustainable America, and Sustainable America is written to fulfill Agenda 21. So why technically we are not necessarily actually implementing Agenda 21 in the United States, in practice we are through Sustainable America. And that is one of the things that most people do not really truly recognize is how intrusive this is into America, Americans' lives. It literally is a very intrusive type of, of um, program. What really bothers, I think, a lot of people is that if you look at sustainable development, which is what Agenda 21 is supposed to create, is sustainable development, it's based on what they call eco-spiritual practices and policy. What does that mean? This is right out of the IUCN. This is what, you won't find it on the website anymore, but in the 1990s it was there. And eco-spiritual policy and principles basically means that nature drives the ship. It means basically that we have to meet nature's needs before we meet human needs. And this basically is eventually going to work itself into all U.S. law, uh, gradually, well, at least regulations. Because in 1994, most of your federal agencies basically wrote up internal working documents based on President Clinton's uh, um, executive order to start to implement it basic international objectives over or changing regulation to fit international objectives versus U.S. objectives or American objectives. 
So over a period of time, we're gradually shifting over very, very slowly without one thing being done in Congress to what to fulfill this international agenda. It's very diabolical, and it is very, very restrictive on human use of our environment and other resources here in America. That's definitely something about the plans that they're implementing. Yes, it is. It is, it is very, I can't overemphasize how intrusive it truly is. And the fact <clears throat> that private property rights are basically destroyed with this plan, because this plan basically assumes that the state or the United States owns all land. It owns your house, it owns your area, the, your lawn and so forth. It owns rural areas, your pastures and forests and so forth. And literally tells those owners or the, the true owners what to pay taxes, what they can and cannot do on their land. That is something that we do not understand fully because private property rights are really the cornerstone of all liberty. Most people do not understand that the Constitution was written basically to, excuse me, to uh, restrain government. Our founders basically be broken away from the from Great Britain. You recall Great Britain. Britain was t basically telling them everything they could do and they couldn't do. And so our founders wrote the Constitution in a way that prohibited the government from intruding into private affairs, especially into private property rights, because they fully understood at that time that private property rights not only allowed us to have liberties, because the government's not telling us what we have to do or not do, but also allows what is called the development of collateral. Now, most homes, most people have private homes and so forth, have been able to acquire property and some equity in that property. And there was a major study done in the year 2000 worldwide by the name of a guy by the name of Hernando de Soto, a, a Peruvian, who basically showed or, or was able to define that almost every American business is started by home equity loans. Now, if you have private property, you have that equity available. But the interesting thing about it is that all third world nations, the former communist nations and so forth, do not have private property. They do not have legally protected private property. And therefore, any lending institutions, banks and so forth, have nothing to base their equity on and they cannot use their home as collateral or equity to borrow money, to build a business, to buy into a business business and else. And that is the secret that has made the United States the most prosperous of all nations in recorded history. The most li f uh, free people in recorded history was the advent and the legal protection of private property rights where the government could not tell you what you can and cannot use your land for. That's abolished with Agenda 21 and Sustainable America. Totally abolished. And as a consequence, as we begin to have more and more regulatory uh, authority over our private property. And remember, private property is, is things that include not only your land and your home and your car and so forth, but also any intellectual rights, any, your money is private property. All these things would be transferred then to the government. And you would no longer have the ability to have access to your private property without getting government approval. That is the key to understand how and why Agenda 21 and Sustainable America is so utterly dangerous to America. Because we are basically giving away the very foundation necessary for our liberty and for our wealth creation. And we have historically had a very prosperous nation, but already we're seeing the effects of this by losing the middle class and so forth as we have more and more regulations. Let me just give you an example. In the United States in 2010, the average um, per capita income in the United States was 45, roughly $45,000. I don't have the exact number right in front of me. In Europe, because of their advanced social states with so many regulations and so many encumbrances on their private property, their average per capita income is 33000 literally $12,000 yes, a, a, a less a year than it is here in the United States states. That might surprise some people. But when you get into the uh, developing nations, 
it's less than $10,000 a year. Now, that is up, surprisingly enough, to about $1,000 a year 10 or 15 years ago before the Soviet Union collapsed and before they began to have some level of private property, say, in the Soviet Union and China and so forth, uh, it was less than $1,000 a year. Now it is less than 10000 sometimes 2000 but in that neighborhood. And if you plot all the per capita income for every nation that has that information available against a relative scale of private property rights in that nation, what you find is a correlation of about 75%. In other words, the wealth of the nation and the wealth of their citizens is fairly well correlated, not significantly, but fairly well correlated to the level of private property rights protections that they have. So it's in a key to understand that what we're doing, it may sound wonderful putting in these green trails and all the rest that we go along with it and, and put encumbrances against people's private property and so forth, but that is eventually going to destroy us. Uh, do you think there is any connection between the Trans-Texas Corridor, the NAFTA Superhighway, and Agenda 21? Oh, absolutely. There's no question in my mind that there is a correlation. The NAFTA Superhighway that has been put or basically put into started to put into effect and the Texas Trans Corridor that was stopped last year actually two years ago I guess it was now was basically designed to build a highway from southern Mexico all the way up into Canada with the port of entry being I think it's in St. Louis if not Kansas City one of those two cities I can't remember which and without any ingress or egress along the way what that meant was meaning for is to move trades and goods from China and so forth throughout the country as well into, into uh, Canada and so forth. It's part of the overall plan for regionalization. Back in 2002, in Monterey, Mexico, they had a meeting. The United Nations had a meeting on development and the environment in which they defined exactly how we're going to develop the economies around the world. And they set up the principle of regionalization in which we have regions in, that are self-contained and then belong to a part of a greater whole led by the United Nations. The, the portion of this part was what we call the North American Union, or what is basically called the North American Union. It includes Mexico, United States, and Canada. Now, this was all decided back in 2002. And right now, there are eight, I believe, of these regions, economic and, and military regions, established around the world. You don't hear anything about them. Very little is said about them. They're not all that functional yet. But the whole the Trans-Texas Corridor, as well as the NAFTA, NAFTA Super Corridor and all the, everything else, was part of that plan to regionalize the world and develop us into economic blocks. It's kind of falling us apart now because of the drug cartels in Mexico. Uh, it's very likely that Mexico is going to fail as a state. I'm not sure what we're going to do as a nation when that happens. But nonetheless, uh, it's very, very problematic that Mexico is going to survive. It's very problematic now that the European Union is going to survive. Most people do not understand the magnitude of what is going on in the European Union. They're holding it together with Band-Aids, literally Band-Aids. And it keeps getting worse every day. Every day they try, they hold it together with bailing wire and, and uh, tape. It generates a little bit more. And when that thing blows apart, it's going to take us down along with it because we have tremendous, we have trillions of dollars that we are involved in in Europe. And when Europe goes, it's going to affect our, our banks and it's going to be a domino effect around the, well, at least the Western world. I don't know that it's, I hope it doesn't happen. I really do. Greece has already defaulted. Greece defaulted last summer. They just have kept it going by giving it some money and, and so forth. Italy is right on the edge. Spain is right on the edge. Portugal is right on the edge. All of these countries, the European banks, have, would have gone under now if the European Central Bank had not given them over a trillion dollars worth of kind of an, a QE. They're QE1 in essence. We've had QE1 and QE2. And we're in the QE3 now where you just print money out of nowhere. And when you print money out of nowhere, you have the more money chasing after the same number of goods, which basically causes inflation or devalues the currency or debox the currency, however you want to put it. 
Since 1980, the United States, the U.S. dollar has declined by 80%. If you wondered why, you can never seem to get ahead. Well, that's why, because you have been falling behind every year because of inflation. Yes, you get raises and so forth, but they have not been keeping up with inflation. And the reason we've had inflation is because the Federal Reserve keeps printing more and more money out of thin air. What is smart growth? Smart growth is a part of Agenda 21, dealing with the urban areas of around the world. Specifically, there is a whole set of regulations and, and intent into sustainable America that affects how urban development is going to occur that meets the requirements of Agenda 21. Smart growth is sold on the basis that it's a real smart thing. It basically puts people closer to the workplace by making forcing people to live within walking distance of where they work. It basically is supposed to cut down on pollution because there's not as much use of automobiles and so forth, mass transport, transportation, light rail, uh, high-speed rail, all of this is part of smart growth, except it's very expensive, and it's not smart at all. Not smart at all. Let me give you some examples. Wherever smart growth has been implemented in this country, the cost of land and the cost of living increases by up to 300 to 600 percent. Why? Because most of your smart growth depends upon having a line drawn around your community in which you have development. You can issue permits for development for any bare land that's within that line. On 100 feet on the other side of that line, it has to be maintained as agricultural land. What does that do? It creates an artificial shortage of land. Not a real shortage, but an artificial shortage. And smart growth then, what it does is it, costs, it greatly increases your cost of living, your taxes and so forth that you have to pay on, a day, uh, on, a base, on an annual basis and so forth. Harvard University did a study about eight years ago in which they took sample quarter acre lots, you know, building lots, which you normally build a home on, around the country. And where you have not had smart growth, You basically found that the, the uh, uh, for that quarter acre lot, many of you remember the time when you might have bought a, a quarter acre for about that price. But if you're in California or you're in one of these smart growth cities anywhere in the country, what you will find is that that same quarter acre lot is now 100000 or 200000 or up to $600,000 for a quarter acre lot. That there is no justification. Harvard did a, a real thorough analysis. And all of that is due to smart growth. There isn't anything due to anything else that could have caused those prices to go up. It's all smart growth. It's artificially created. Now, what happens when you have the, the housing bubble burst like we did in 2007 and 8? Well, those are the areas in which all of a sudden you may have paid $800,000 for your house and it's now worth $400,000. Because of smart growth, it was an artificial construct to start with, and those particular cities were the hardest hit when the housing bubble burst back in 2007, 2008. If you go to cities that had no smart growth, what you basically found is that the housing bubble had a small influence. I mean, it went down a little bit, but very, very little in comparison to what it went down in the larger communities that had smart growth installed. Smart growth is not smart, folks. It is horribly expensive. Where you have this light rail in place, you can have a huge overhead costs. Uh, the average, and I haven't looked at this in several years, so it could be different now. At a, say, a $5 ticket for an individual ride, it usually called, cost the system at least $20. And there were some systems in this country in which it was $40 for a $5 ride. That comes out of your taxpayers' pockets, and that means your taxes go up. This light rail concept is a, is a boondoggle beyond anything that you can believe. Bus transportation, it pays for itself. Light rail does not, high-speed rail at this point does not either. And there's no way, there's no future in that in the sense that it's going to pay, start paying for it sometime in the future. So what you're seeing here is basically an artificial construct that's supported by taxpayers' dollars that really do not improve the quality 
quality of living one iota and makes your misery index much worse because people have to pay it out of the same salary they had uh, and they can't afford it. What is the role of the ICLEI's local governments for sustainability program in setting up the ICLEI? The ICLEI, there's two there's two major planning groups in this country. One is the American Planning Association, and the other one is ICLEI. And I cannot remember what the acronym means. It's just escaped from my mind. But basically, if you just type in ICLEI into Google, it'll take you to their website. It's an international organization. It was created back in the um, 1990s to fulfill Agenda 21. It's directly connected to the United Nations, although ICLEI people will deny it adamantly. They try have they tried to create ICLEI USA to try to make it so that it wasn't part of the United Nations. But folks, the links are still there. They're still primarily object. They're primarily trying to create the conditions in their local community that's going to cut down on carbon emissions and otherwise imp implement smart growth planning in your community. But the primary purpose is global warming and reduction of carbon dioxide emissions. Basically, they have convinced hundreds and hundreds of cities here in the United States to become members of ICLEI. When that ha happens, ICLEI will provide them a plan for their city at low cost. This plan has been co in cooperation with the American Planning Association, and they have several dozens of these templates in which, depending upon what, city, what kind of a city it is and what its overall uh, conditions are, you can pick one of these plans off of the shelf put your name on it, change a few things within it, and instantaneously you have a, a plan. But that plan basically does all the wrong things, as I said, with smart growth. It's going to make your community more expensive to live in. It's going to increase your misery index because now they're going to try to force you into uh, homes or dwellings, usually more family dwellings, closer to where you work so you don't have to use your car. All of these things are basically designed to basically corral the American people into very small living zones, which then makes up is called the Wildlands Project. They have, for over 20 years now, attempted to create or implement what is known as the Wildlands Project. The Wildlands Project is to try to herd all the people off the rural area of America into cities and other built-up areas, and then use a lot of that, that rural area as wildlife life corridors are reserves. They call them reserves and corridors. They hope to have within 50 years one half of this country into wilderness core reserves and corridors. One half. They're already starting to do it in Europe and other parts of the, of the world where they've signed on to the Convention on Biological Diversity, another United Nations treaty, part of Agenda 21. That particular treaty was brought up in a U.S. Senate back in 1994. Uh, we, I had been following this for, for a number of years. It started in 1992 with the Earth Summit. I began to draw a map. I have a Ph.D. in ecosystems analysis as well as a minor in climatology, and I've led a multi-million dollar research effort in climatology when I was still affiliated with the university. But the field, the, the fact is that this biodiversity tree was designed and eventually to create this reserve and corridor pattern all over the world and in oceans and so forth so that basically one half of every nation, including the United States, would be set aside in these reserves and corridors. There would be no roads or very limited roads, no communities. They even had a plan basically to rip out small towns and so forth right out by their foundations so that they could turn them back over to nature. You if you go to the western United States, you don't see them so much here in the east, but if you go to the western United States, along some of the interstates, you will find wildlife bridges. Millions of dollars to build a bridge for wildlife. That's it. Or a tunnel for wildlife. Of course, the wildlife doesn't use them, but nonetheless, it's there. It's all part of this wildlands project. I, I was able, because of my background in um, systems analysis and so forth, using the template that they had created themselves, the IUCN itself, as to how to designate these reserves and corridors, I was able to create over a couple of years a map that would designate where these were likely to go. This was back in the early 1990s. 
when 1994 came up and, and basically, <coughs> excuse me, basically the treaty first came out for ratification in August of 19. 19- on August 3rd, it was supposed to be the closure vote and ratification vote was scheduled for the 8th of August. I knew it was a very dangerous treaty. And this is, I want to give you this for a little bit of hope because it's amazing what a single person can do. A group of people can even do more. But basically, I went down to the U.S. Senate in July, tried to talk to the Senate leadership that this was, was a very dangerous treaty. I was basically ignored because I had no proof that they wanted to use this uh, Convention on Biological Diversity to implement the wildland project, even though they had verbiage that fit perfectly, that is never called the Wildlands Project. And so, in August 3rd, when this came out, I had already developed a map, maybe three quarters of the United States, and was able then to take that map, FedEx it down, well, let me explain. No, that was in September enough time has gone by i was able to put out a fax alert now what is a fax alert a fax alert was an amazing technology that lasted maybe two years uh, it allowed us to send out thousands of faxes overnight before you always had to send them one, one by one and and this allowed us to send out thousands of them which we did on one page fax i had a little bit of a map of what i had been working on as well well as a set of bullet points illustrating what this treaty was designed to do. I was amazed the next day when the Senate called me personally and asked me what I was doing. Well, I had just been down there a few weeks before that, so they knew who I was. And I basically told them, I'm trying to alert people that this is a dangerous treaty. You're getting ready to ratify it. And they said, well, you're, you're doing an amazing job. We're getting thousands and thousands of phone calls on this. And I was, I, was, I was pleased, but it certainly couldn't have been me. I, I, I think it was a real miracle. By the 3 o'clock that same afternoon, I got a call from the Senate Majority Leader's office. I had talked to that staffer, uh, again, two or three weeks before that. She knew who I was. And the first words out of her mouth, I didn't know who it was, said, call off your dogs. And I said, what do you mean, call off my dogs? And she explained who she was, and she said, there are so many calls coming in that it broke down the Senate phone system. They have a computerized uh, phone system for the public. They also have other phone systems, but this one broke down. It was overloaded at the time. They could not keep it up. Every time they would reboot it, it would crash again because literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were calling in about this. And of course, they happened to get a copy of my fax alert. Somebody had sent them one, so they knew who to call. Well, anyway, the Senate Majority Leader said, you know, if there's this much interest in it, I'm going to postpone it. So he postponed it. And I had just told him that he needed to get a copy of what is known as the Global Biodiversity Assessment out of the United Nations. We had a contract that was issued a year before, a couple of years before, that was supposed to be complete in April of that year. This is August. And so it should be at least in draft form. And as a consequence, it's called the Global Biodiversity Assessment, and it was the uh, basically the background material to why a treaty was necessary. And as a consequence, it, the treaty itself was only about 16 pages long. It said nothing but motherhood and apple pie statements. Uh, There's no way that a, a, a senator could look at that and see anything that was wrong with it because there was nothing very alarming in the way that, that treaty was written. But hidden in that treaty was all of this kind of language to implement the Wildlands Project. And so I was, I was able to use that then to get it stopped in August. Senator Mitchell, who was a majority leader at the time, was able to call the United Nations, because I asked him to, to see if they couldn't get a copy of this particular document. The United Nations told him that, no, they don't know what that document is. They've never heard of that document. They have no intention of ever writing that document, even though I had the contract right in my hands and uh, please ratify our treaty. So he put it aside and came back to it in September. And about long about the 26th of September, he issued another, um, put on the executive calendar for a closure vote on the 29th, I think it was, of September. In the meantime, I had met several other people who were also fighting this treaty. 
we eventually formed Sovereignty International, what is uh, so 501c3. And one of the individuals that I met knew someone in New York City. Well, New York City is, of course, the headquarters of the United Nations. And they thought that this person could probably get this document out of the United Nations because they're right there. Well, it turns out that person couldn't. But she knew somebody in London. She, that person couldn't. I don't know if it was a man or a woman there. But that person could not uh, get that document. They had no idea what it was. But they knew someone in Germany, in Bern, Germany, that might have some affiliation with this uh, document. That person didn't, but they knew who did. They knew somebody in Glans, Switzerland. Now, what in the world is in Glans, Switzerland? Well, Glans, Switzerland is the headquarters of the IUCN that I've been talking about uh, during this interview. They're the big dog on environmental activism in, this, in the world. And basically, they had no idea who we were. They wrote the Global Biodiversity Assessment or helped write it and was able because they thought by this time, you know, any relationship as to who we were was lost after all the going through all these people. They thought we were, were promoting the treaty. So they FedExed the chapter that was really pertinent to uh, this treaty to our FedEx. Yeah, FedEx the treaty to us and not the, not the treaty, but the Global Biodiversity Assessment. FedEx it to us. It was just one chapter it was 400 pages long. Each of us took 100 pages of that because the treaty was to be ratified the following day and started to read. You would not believe what was in this document. I don't have it before me, so I can't really tell you uh, other than just general statements. They, they wanted to establish the old feudal system, you know, where you have the nobility, a few rich people, and the rest of us are, are, are basically impoverished people. This was one of their goals because they believed that impoverished people could not hurt the environment as much as rich people could. Therefore, we need to go back to the feudal system of the Dark Ages. Another thing that they had was that they wanted to establish the Wildlands Project. They wanted to deny all property rights. They wanted to control all property rights. That was no, no surprise. They wanted to reduce the Earth's population by at least two-thirds in the next 50 years. This was one of the goals. And uh, I could go on and on and on. They basically wanted to establish a new religion based on nature, which is called pantheism. Uh, all of these things were there, but the key thing that really helped us was the fact that they said we must implement the Wildlands Project, gave the specific uh, reference to it, and which basically would, would occupy at least 42% of the American land, or the landscape. Didn't say American, but that would be true for any nation. And of course, that was the Wildlands Project. Once we had that, we were able to highlight the key portions of the document, and there was a lot of key portions and FedEx it to the Senate, along with the map that I had been drawing for the last couple of years. That map was taken out on the U.S. Senate floor by K Senator K. Bailey Hutchinson at 3 o'clock in the afternoon the following day. The closure vote, followed by the ratification vote, was scheduled for 4 o'clock. One hour before the closure vote, the map and this document was taken out by K. Bailey Hutchinson, Senator K. Hutchinson, and she read the key. He, some of the key, not all of them, because there was way too much, but all, all, some of the key phrases, and then pulled out this map. This map was in a four by six foot poster, and basically brought the Senate to a standstill. Senator Mitchell, who was the majority leader at the time, withdrew it from the Senate, Senator, uh, Senate calendar. It was never voted on, ever. It's still there. It could be brought out at any time, but he pulled it off, and it has never been brought out to the light of day since that time. So. You can see how if you just keep plugging away and trying to bring the truth to people, you can have an impact. Uh, what will Agenda 21 uh, do to the counties and the small town cities specifically? You're, you're breaking up. I can't understand you. What will Agenda 21 uh, do to the states, the counties, the small towns, and cities? 
Well, one of the things that Agenda 21 is designed to do is to put the national government in charge of all lower governments. Now, you may or may not remember when you took civics and so forth in high school and, and elementary school that our Constitution is set up for states' rights. The states are what created the federal government. They have supposedly had autonomy from the federal government ever since, or state rights. The local governments are also separate from the federal government. The federal government has no right, and there's many, many Supreme Court decisions to uphold this, has no right to tell the states and the local governments what they can and cannot do. Uh, as a consequence, what we're beginning to see happen now is that Agenda 21 puts all authority in the hands of the U.S. or federal government. And there are various things that the federal government is trying to do right now through the use of grants and aid and contracts with the states and the local governments to subsume state rights and local rights and make the federal government all powerful. If they have that for a period of time, it becomes that's just the way it is in everybody's minds. In fact, if you ask, ask the average citizen right now uh, who has the greatest authority in the, in the country is of what level of government, they'll say the federal government. But the federal government, as designed by our Constitution, has the least authority. It's the most distant from the people, and it's only got 18 enumerated powers in the Constitution. Now, there's been a group of people called progressives. I'm not going to get into this too much in, uh, right now. But this group of people, for the last 100 years, has systematically tried to destroy the first of the, of the Article I of the Constitution that defines the powers of the federal government. They have incrementally passed law after law after law that goes beyond those 18 enumerated powers until the now the federal government has thousands of powers and basically has become the most powerful form of government here in the country. But in doing so, they have created all kinds of problems for people because now a person cannot do anything without becoming uh, a criminal in the eyes of the federal government. And as a consequence, what we're seeing here, and it has to be stopped, and it can be stopped in this next election, we need to get rid of these progressives, and we need to go back to a constitutional republic. We're not a democracy, as we're constantly told all the time. We're a constitutional republic in which the federal government is there at the pleasure of the states, not the reverse. Uh, is the purpose of Agenda 21 is to help set up a world government? Yes. Uh, in fact, this was we have evidence going right back to the creation of the United Nations that suggests very strongly that they knew right from the very start that the United Nations was eventually to become a world government. There, there's all kinds of plans that have been written up over the last 15 years to show how this is going to be administered. Uh, they, they wanted to form regional economic blocks around the country, as I described a little bit earlier, and the central part of this would be the United Nations Economic and Security Council. They would be the big dog on the block, and they would administer the various regions. The regions themselves would re, uh, administer the various nations, or states as they're called internationally, and the, the nations would then administer what goes on in the smaller subdivisions of whatever they have in their particular nations. For us, it's states and local governments. So it's a top-down form of government, as has always been uh, the goal to create a international, or they call it global governance. They're not ashamed of calling that. It's called global governance, but in fact, it's a world government. All right, thanks for uh, doing the interview. That's all the questions I got. Okay. Good. I will, I will send you a copy of the interview. Excellent. Thank you. I'm sorry I was late. I, I got involved in something else, and you know how time goes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks. We'll talk to you later. All right.